As I stood there, my habit watches, that was true one. So out through the back door of the roses I ran, where the horses were tied. Like he couldn't run I pulled his back In a way I did ride Just as fast as I could From the West Texas Down to El Paso Through the badlands of New Mexico Back in El Paso My life would be worthless Everything's gone in life Nothing is left So long since I've seen a young maiden Who is stronger than my fear of death Catch me, I've got to make it to Rose's back door. Something is dreadfully wrong for I feel. I'm burning pain in my side. It's been harder to stay in the saddle. I'm getting weary, unable to ride. But my love. In her eyes where I've fallen Though I am weary I can't stop to rest I see the white puff The smoke from the rifle I feel the bullet Go deep in my chest From out of the way Felina has found me Kissing my cheek As she kneels by my side Cradled by two loving arms that I'll die for One little kiss and Felina Good Stay tuned for the uh, for the the round table, the panel panel discussion, because I you know I think we're going to be armed. <laughs> At least there'll be fruit in there.
count this off? Why don't you start us off? Okay. One, let's see. One, two, three. I lived out from Reno, I was trailed by 20 hounds Didn't get to sleep last night till the morning come around Said I run but take my time, friend of the devil is friend of mine I get home before daylight, just might get some sleep tonight I ran into the devil be 20 bills Spent the night in Utah In a cave up in the hills Sit up, run, but take my time Friend of the devil is a friend of mine I get home before daylight Just might get some sleep tonight I ran down to the levee But the devil caught me there Sweet Anne Marie, she's my heart's delight. Second one is prison bay, sheriff's on my trail. If he catches up with me, well, I'll spend my life in jail. I've got a wife in Chino Bay, one in Cherokee. First one says she got my child, but it don't look like me. friend of mine I get home before daylight just might get some sleep
cry Way each lonely night First one named Sweet and Marie She's my heart's delight Second one is prison, babe Sheriff's on my trail And if he catches up with me Well, I'll spend my life in jail Devil, babe, and you can borrow from a friend. Devil, give you twenty dollar bill. Your friend, he only got ten. Sit down, run, but take my time. Friend of devil, this friend of mine. I get home before daylight. Just might get some sleep.
Good, good, good. Get, get it going. <laughs>
This next one, <laughs> I kind of parked it for 20 or so years. Um, but these guys, uh, these guys suggested we do this tonight. I'm kind of glad they did because it made me have to have to uh, redo the bridge, which was always a hang-up for me. <laughs> this is this one's unfortunately a tale that uh, never tires of telling itself. You don't want to kick it off? Sure. Go there for a while and we'll just yeah. stay. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> I would say that the blame was mine, but I suspect it's 
something worse take a short break and y'all out in the uh, in the in the video world out there in the internet um, you're gonna get a, a, a short video and then we're gonna have a fracas with a bunch of talking heads and then we're gonna come back and play so that's the plan unregistered voters and it also uh, motivates people to get involved in the uh, you know in the, the American political process it's this awesome group of people that brings together two things they really care about music and politics headcount uh, hopes to continue to register voters and get these kids to be as socially conscious and active as possible one of the most important things that headcount does is it keeps people informed it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter what kind of music you listen to, it matters that we want to do something positive. Headcount was founded on the principle that the music community really could make a difference. That between the energy and the passion of the fans, the musicians being natural leaders, if someone organized it, we really could be a force. So it started out with voter registration. We've registered over 175,000 people, mostly at concerts, just through our volunteers walking up to people saying, are you registered to vote? And then we've taken it to another level that's about social consciousness, the idea that you can make a difference every day, not just on election day. And I think that's really what has helped us emerge as a true force within the community. You know, it's a way that we as a musical community can say what are the things that are most important to us and how can we support them and support others in doing it. And it's, it's not about left and right, it's not about Republican and Democrat, it's about each of us taking responsibility for our communities. And uh, that's why I love HeadCamp. You look into the issues, uh, develop your, you know, inform yourself and develop your opinions and then uh, and then go hammer your friends and the candidates and, uh, and make yourself a vital part of a functioning democracy. But you, you only got on there about recently, right? Camera Miller fan? It was wide open. It's still What's the main camera? I just announced about a month ago that I was getting out of the report. Welcome back. Thank you so very much. I hope you're all enjoying the bridge session. This is really an incredible night, and that was an incredible set of music. Uh, you just saw Brother Isao. I believe it's the first time it's been played in 20 years, and we're really honored 
uh, by Bob and members of the National and all the musicians with them who came from Brooklyn, New York, out here to Marin County for the bridge session. We're going to spend about 20 minutes now talking about what's going on outside these walls, talking about what's happening in the world, and trying to come to some common understandings, explore our differences, which is always fun, and explore some of the places where maybe we have a lot in common. Um, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you for a second first to talk music for one second because we're honored to have John Perry Barlow here, longtime Grateful Dead lyricist, and uh, I understand that John's been busy for the last couple of days working on that song. Could you just kind of tell us a little bit oh, about it, what happened? It, 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 it wasn't anything like as industrious as that. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby called me up uh, in New York and said, you know, I'm thinking about breaking this out and uh, there are a couple of things I want to mess with, which is, you know, he's always been good at messing with stuff, uh, but usually he doesn't do it, you know, after a 20-year lag. <laughs> uh, so we, we talked through it and actually uh, it, it didn't take us long. There were very few changes and uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't hard work, really. I mean, I, I just wanted to see it get out there again and, and Part of what Bobby wanted to do, and I and I respect this, is that it was very temporal. It was about Vietnam, uh, and well, and the Bible, but it was it was about those who went to Vietnam and those who stayed, and unfortunately, we still have this going on, uh, unabated. Uh, so he wanted to make it a little more timeless, and I agreed. Well, it's a great segue into our conversation. I, I do want to say before we get started that if you're enjoying the webcast out there, please support Headcount. Uh, you can order merchandise from this event, a t-shirt or a poster, or you can make a donation. Our website is headcount.org. The merchandise is at tristudios.com. And, uh, you know, if this is successful, we'll hopefully do a lot more events like this. And with your support, we're out there registering voters every day. Every major city in America, there's a headcount team of volunteers registering voters. So your support really means a lot to us. We hope people enjoying this webcast will support us by buying merchandise or making donations. That said, let's get into this panel. We have a really incredible group of people. I'm going to introduce them really quickly. All the way to the left there is Governor Buddy Romer, a uh, member of, former member of Congress, former governor of Louisiana, and this year a presidential candidate. Uh, we have John Perry Barlow, who we've uh, introduced already, and John Perry Barlow was a, a real key person in bringing the Stop Internet Piracy Act to the forefront this year and, and, and driving opposition to that. Uh, we have Jesse Tolkien, a person that I have mad respect for, uh, a great activist for you, young people in America um, on issues such as climate change and many others. I think you're all going to learn a lot about this person and what she brings to the table tonight. And we have here Mark McKinnon. Mark, uh, many years ago, was a country music songwriter hanging out with Chris Christopherson and decided he might do a little better in D.C. Uh, doing uh, media advice. And he's an advisor, or has been, to George W. Bush, to John McCain, to Lance Armstrong, and to Bono, and many others. And we're very honored to have him. What he's doing now is also something called No Labels, which is calling for getting rid of yeah, the right and left, Democrat, Republican, and just kind of uh, let's all talk and let's figure out what we need to do. And that's the theme of the bridge session. So I think this is a great panel representing a lot of different viewpoints. And we're going to get into it. We're going we're gonna to dive into three issues that we think people care about a lot. And, uh, and then we're going to take some issues via Twitter. So let's get into it. Um, we'll just queue up the graphic here. And we're going to count it down. Um, and that'll actually come in a couple of seconds. But um, we're going to start with, I believe we're going to start with money and politics is the issue. Or we're going to start with personal freedom. Uh, the, this is an issue that at Headcount we really feel is one that is not right or left, is not Democrat or Republican. It's something that a lot of people have different viewpoints on, but everyone really cares about. And I'm going to start with just kind of a, an open question. Is our personal freedom in, in jeopardy? Uh, is the First Amendment in trouble? Are people trying to take away Americans' freedoms? <laughs> Well, well, you see it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a community banker. Uh, founded a bank, didn't foreclose on a single mortgage, didn't take any money from the federal government. And we have passed by the Congress and signed by the President years ago the Patriots Act, which basically takes away our freedom, which really tells the world we can no longer be free to protect our security. I think it's a bad choice. And it's those kinds of things like PIPA, the Patriots Act and other things that we take the easy way out in this country and don't stand for our liberties. I would add that on, on personal freedom, uh, we're being swamped by special interest money. The Supreme Court decision of a year ago, Citizens United, 
has created what we call the super PACs. And the super PACs are spending uh, undisclosed money in unlimited amounts and are swamping the system uh, with money from millionaires and billionaires. And they're spending more money than the actual candidates that are running for elections. So when you ask about your personal freedom, well, our freedom is being overtaken by, by special interests who, who the Supreme Court has said don't have enough money, don't have enough control or authority, and now have unlimited control and authority. And it's corrupting our system in ways that, uh, that are unimaginable, really. I, I mean, they're, they're terrifying times, right? Headcount is in the business of engaging everyday people in their democracy, in elections. And the way it should work is that you register to vote, you turn out on election day, and then your elected officials work for you. We get to show up in D.C. or call them on the issues we care about. And now the day they take office, these politicians are bought and paid for by corporations, right? So the promise of what we're trying to offer the American people is really at risk as a result of Citizens United. And when you look at the United States Congress today, they're owned by the oil industry and the gas industry, and we wonder why we can't make you know, efforts on climate change. And so I, I think these are, are really terrifying times. And I think that, per personally, I think that makes it all the more important for the people to stand up and try to take their system back. You know, uh, I'm currently working on an effort to fund WikiLeaks uh, in spite of the fact that uh, private institutions, which had a perfect right to do this legally, uh, created a financial embargo for WikiLeaks. And I was having a conversation with one of the people that, that I'm coming together to do this with, Daniel Ellsberg, the other day. And he said, you know, it's good for us to, to bear in mind that if we support WikiLeaks, we can be regarded as supporting terrorism. And if we are supporting terrorism, we can be regarded as terrorists. And it has been declared by the President of the United States, the Secretary of Defense, the head of the CIA, that the United States reserves and has the right now to summarily execute any terrorist anywhere. And I said, well, that's extreme. And he said, but it's real, and it is real. So, I mean, even though I think freedom of expression uh, is stronger in some respects, thanks to the Internet, than it's ever been, the ability of those who might want to stop you from speaking freely has never been stronger uh, or, or more uh, savage in its capacities. Well, and, it's, and it's, gotten, it's gotten, let me stand on that point and say, we don't run the country anymore. Big checks do. Yeah. I mean, members of Congress spend their time raising money from special interests. That's what they do. In fact, they get selected by their party because he or she can raise a lot of money. I've seen it a hundred times in the written descriptions. I mean, I don't take PAC money, but they live on PAC money. I don't have a super PAC, but they are slave to the super PACs. Look, this is not a party issue. Republicans are not going to change America. Democrats are not going to change America. We are. These two parties are joined at the billfold. I was in Washington three days ago. I talked to a lobbyist. He said his company spends one and a half million dollars a year in football and baseball tickets to give to members of Congress so he can get their darn vote. What is wrong with that picture? And it's worse than that. It's not just so he can get their vote. It's so that he can go to the game with them and spend the entire time indoctrinating them. Yes. That's where it really goes down. Well, if you put, let me put a picture together. The biggest corporate giver in America four years ago in Obama versus McCain was a little company called GE. Guess who paid no taxes last year? Good investment, GE. They fired 25,000 Americans, sent the jobs overseas, made $15 billion, and didn't pay one penny in federal income tax. And just to give you an, uh, an idea of the manifestation of how the money works now, what's happening in key Senate races, let's take Colorado for example, in the last cycle. The candidates raised a certain amount of money, but the super PAC and special interest money raised five, six, seven, eight times as much money as the candidates. So the race was not actually between the candidates, it was between the Chamber of Commerce and the unions. So it's become all about special interest rather than the actual candidates themselves. And we are going to go to this topic of money in politics, which just really seems to be at the root of almost everything. There's almost every issue gets back to this one thing. And I, I think there seems to be a lot of agreement here that this is a crisis. What can we do about it? What are the remedies? 
Well, <laughs> let's, let's kick that over he's, to Buddy Rowan. He's, he's working on it. <laughs> I, I've, you know, I'm a granddaddy. I'm 68. Uh, I've been out of politics for 16 years. I built my, I love Louisiana. What a great place. When I was governor of Louisiana, it was a corrupt state, and I stood up to it, and we sent people to jail, and we cleaned it up, and our state has done much better in the last 20 years. Here's the key. We need a president free to lead, and we need a woman or a man to run for president who is free to do the right thing, to listen, to build a team, to build a nation, not a party. So I decided on my own, with no fanfare, no polls, and no money, to stand up about a year ago and say, $100 limit, no PAC money, we're gonna do it on the internet, no super PAC money, we will listen to the American people. And we're up to four or 5% in the polls, it doesn't sound like much, but we have, our average gift is $25. California is my second largest giver as a state. We are building something in this country that's gonna stand up to the system and to both parties. I'm not putting them down. I was a Democrat in Congress for 20 years. I was a Republican for 20 years. Each party <laughs> has some good things, but here's the bad news. They meet at the billfold, and I'll tell you what becomes before young people money. We need to change it. Yeah. I, so I think it's it's about a lot more than just who's running for office, right? I was just talking to my friend here before we got started. I think the political headline of this year is disruption. I think this should be the political year where we stand up for the 99%. Yeah. I think watching the Occupy movement, uh, you know, s you know, spring up across the country, and I think it's it's having its second spring right now, has been a remarkable thing. And I think it's so important. Yes, we can be doom and gloom about how our system is so messed up. But the power of the people is not gone, right? That sounds like a phrase we said decades ago. It's true. The power of the people is not gone. And we see that when people want to disrupt, results happen. They yeah. absolutely do. And so I think we have to disrupt, 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 and realize that it is our right to disrupt the current yeah, system. Yeah, that's, that's the good news. And I think uh, arguably never before in our history have the, the, the issues been as challenging as they are today, and never has the system been more paralyzed for reasons we could talk about for an hour or so. But to your point, there are great manifestations of people power emerging and flourishing everywhere. And uh, let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Andy, the, the organization that we started about a year ago called No Labels, which was a way to try and bring more civil dialogue to try and, and, and make Congress work again. We put out a 12-step action plan, a 12-step ref uh, stel reform plan for, <laughs> for Congress. Uh, and a number of other things, but already it's attracted 500,000 people, grassroots activists all over the country. There's another, uh, another enterprise that's happening called Americans Elect, and to Buddy, I want to plug Buddy here for a moment because he is an announced candidate now for Americans Elect. There's going to be three uh, parties on the ticket this November. There's going to be the Democratic Party, there's going to be the Republican Party, and there's going to be something called Americans Elect on all 50 ballots. And Buddy Romer may be on that ticket. It's going to be a unity ticket, a Democrat and Republican, a Republican and Democrat, or an independent. And they're going to be on all 50 state ballots. So this is going to be a disruptive influence, and it's going to have a big impact. And I think with the right ticket, arguably in this environment, they get win, but at the very least, they will qualify for the debates in the fall, so it's going to get interesting. Bobby, you've seen every side of this from the acid test things completely outside of the the political structure to many dc fundraisers i mean what is your take on this money in politics issue from from having that perspective well it's feated um it, <laughs> that's not what our founding fathers had in mind i'll, I'll tell you that um this 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 recent ruling the, by the Supreme Court that, uh, that holds that uh, corporations are people, well, then put them in prison, execute them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. them. The death penalty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> execute them. <laughs> but you can't. So, you know. How's that for a tall mound of horse shit? <laughs> uh, they're not people. They're, they're machines. They're made up by people, but no, they're made up by people's money. You invest your money in the corporation, you have ownership. It's not you, it's your money. And, uh, and they amass a lot of money, and then they go spend it on Congress. And 
I have, I just have a hunch that, uh, that that's really not what our founding fathers had in mind when they were, when they were drawing up the Constitution. Nothing even remotely like that. Well, let's move on to the 2012 election, the presidential election. And I want to, I want to start with Mark McKinnon. So, Mark, you have advised John McCain. You've advised George W. Bush. Um, people are calling this Republican nomination process a lot of things. What are you calling it? <laughs> I call it a train wreck. <laughs> uh, the, uh, charitable. Well, b that said, uh, the... Uh, that's why I'm excited about the Americans elect option. I think there's going to be some interesting candidates like Buddy Romer step forward. But, but my view is that, that the way the system has been corrupted by the influence of money and the issues that we've been talking about, it doesn't really matter who the Republicans nominate or elect. It doesn't really matter who the Democrats, because they're so hostage to the system that's been created and by the money in politics that it's going to take some sort of disruptive influence to break it open. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not particularly excited about what I see on the Republican side of the, the aisle, and that's why I like to see uh, some alternative opportunity. You know, here's here's a here's a mystery to me. Why is it that in in reportedly or supposedly the greatest democracy in the world, why do we only have two choices? You know, we're the only democracy that only has two choices. Why? And it's always a sort of a lesser of two evil options. So uh, I, I'm because excited. it's a game of control. Yeah. A and you know why the caucuses are behind closed doors? They don't want the public to know what happens. I'm the only guy running for president who's been elected to Congress and governor. I know this system, folks, and it's run by money. And the money doesn't come from the people. It doesn't come from working people or small business people or cotton farmers or wheat farmers or ranchers in Wyoming. It comes from special interests who want one damn thing, to make more money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 guess. I, want to, I want to support your point about how disruptive we need to be at this point. I mean, we have to be extremely disruptive to, to take the large percentage of the American people that are pretending to be asleep and get them to wake up. But, you know, in the spirit of this occasion, we have to think about what's the most disruptive thing we can do, and that is to vote. Even though it may, it may mean holding your nose. Fortunately, thanks to people like Buddy, it may not. But, but you have to go out and vote. You have to actually believe that that is still a meaningful process. Well, I echo that 100%. I've spent most of my life trying to engage the millennial generation in voting and in politics, and I still believe that uh, our system can be salvaged. Uh, we can live up to the promise of our democracy if, uh, if we encourage people to vote. And that's, I think, why it's so terrifying in the election of 2012 that we see uh, unprecedented attempts to limit the ability to vote. There's actually a war on voting right. across the country right now, right. directly targeted, in my opinion, in suppressing the youth vote, the African American vote, right. and the Latino vote. And and I know we're about we're about bridging the political gaps in this conversation, but I just have to be very clear that I think there is a huge difference between the two parties in this election. We have a Republican primary set of primary candidates that have launched a war on women. We are fighting a debate in the Republican primary about things that we fought about 40 years ago when it became, we talked about women's rights. We have a Republican primary denying science around climate change. So uh, I think we should have more than two choices. Uh, I agree that the Democrats have done their fair share of, of bad stuff over the course of the past few years. But uh, I think it's important for the people watching tonight to know that there are pr some pretty significant differences out there in those that are, that are pursuing the Oval Office in But there's one point where there's no difference. You know what phone calls they answer? From the guys who send them big checks. They don't answer your phone call. Try it sometime. So call folks, this White House and ask. So, folks, here's your chance. <laughs> this, what, the, what this evening is about is to get you all off your butts and register to vote. Study up. See what the, what the candidates have to say. Regardless of uh, what you hear about us, us saying about them, you study up and, and see where it hits you. And vote your, vote your conscience. Vote your heart. And... Yeah. and get your friends to do that, it's the only way that we're going to find people who will have the kind of support, the, find a, the kind of mandate, if you will, that's going to get them to kick money out of Washington, out of politics. You can, it's the you only can, way. You can also 
put money, the right kind of money, in Washington, too. I mean, I, I thought that, that we'd had a sea change when Obama was elected, largely on the strength of small donations. And I think that can be done again. It probably won't be done by him, because uh, he hasn't governed that way. I'm but, not sure it can be done we, again we can, we can do that some more, and I, I, I can't urge you strongly enough to donate to the candidates that you feel strongly about, uh, and 25 bucks makes a difference, it as does. you know. My average gift has been 25 bucks, almost a million dollars, just from real people. It makes a difference. If you could have a million people stand with you, Bob, and you could raise that kind of money, you can win a primary in either party. If you had That's three right. million people stand with you, you could be President of the United States. Three million people. There are that many young people in the Midwest. That's right. Young people, I've seen them change the world. I used to be young. I know that's hard <laughs> to believe. But I remember growing up on a cotton farm in Louisiana and watching young people walk the streets so that black people, African American people, would have the right to vote and to fall in love with whoever they wanted to and to start their own company and be treated like a human being. The government didn't do that. Young people and dedicated people That's made true. that change. I remember being in college and watching young people, I was one of them, walk the streets against the Vietnam War, and they brought that war to a halt. Congress didn't do that, Bob. No, young no. people did. And I'm saying I love America. It's a nation at risk. And you know who's going to change it? Not Washington. Young people. Yeah. Register. Yeah. Register. You can change the world. That's what tonight's all about. Well, I got, we're going to now go to some questions that have come in via Twitter and Facebook, uh, probably from young people. And one that I think is very relevant is for you, Governor Romer. Um, as a former governor of Louisiana, what are your feelings about the Keystone Pipeline? I'm a supporter of energy alternatives. I think we're a nation that, that is going to end up with natural gas drilled safely. Now, I'm an environmentalist. I got the Sierra Club Award as governor of Louisiana. That is really unusual. Probably. I'll never win another race after that. But, but I, I think we, we have domestic energy that we can develop. But we need to have courage, and we need to have an energy plan. We don't have one now. We're addicted to foreign oil. I would drill for natural gas. I would use fracking. I know that's controversial, but I've studied it. Below 5,000 feet, it's safe, Jesse. Talk to me later. Below 5,000 feet. But here's what it is, Jesse. I want to give you this. It's 20% of the carbon footprint of oil. 20%. The biggest environmental thing we could do would be to quit buying oil from the Middle East and develop natural gas in America. That'll put three million American women and men to work, and it's much cleaner than oil. There are things we can do like that are smart. We need to develop alternative energies, but we need to be free of the oil addiction. We are now sending young men and women on oil duty in the Middle East. They're wearing uniforms and they're getting killed. We ought to stop it. I'm going to go to a question submitted by Alexandra May Hunter, and it's, uh, we'll, we'll get you in there, Jesse. Okay. All right, well, I, I couldn't do that to Jesse. Quick, quick thing on fracking here. Uh, <laughs> fracking is not safe. We don't need fracking. An energy policy is not an all of the above energy policy. Uh, I committed my first act of civil disobedience, getting arrested against the Keystone Pipeline. It will not make gas cheaper. We have the Saudi Arabia equivalent of solar in this country. We have the Saudi Arabia equivalent of wind in this country. Let's get off foreign oil, but let's not drill our way out of the energy crisis. Two hours south of here in the Silicon Valley, we have all of the technology we need to have a clean and a truly clean energy revolution in this country. And we just don't need to compromise on this issue one bit. I agree, but we need to do it all, Jesse. We are slave to foreign oil. I support both your positions. <laughs> <laughs> Red <Bridge. State. laughs> All right, We have a question submitted uh, by, by Facebook from Alexandra May Hunter. On women's issues, what does Bob and JPP, John Perry Barlow, have to say on supporting the ongoing issues that continue to occur, occur with regards to women's rights and equal equality? Bob has two daughters, JPP has three, and I have two, and it's important that we continue to stand up for our ladies. Well, he just answered your question for yourself, but um, <laughs> yeah, I got a couple of daughters. Uh, I want them to have all the choices and all the uh, all the 
all the freedoms and and uh, and opportunities that they possibly can have. Uh, it goes without saying. John, I, you know, I used to be a Republican, but at this point uh, in the Republican primary season, I'd have to say that any woman who votes Republican has a case of Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> Mark, you've, uh, you know, we want to keep this balanced and I want to get your perspective. There have definitely been a lot of shots from the left on this panel. Yeah. I mean, do you think that the rank and file Republicans, Republicans in power are really, is there a war on women? Well, I, I, here's my problem uh, that, and, and I think Buddy and I would agree on this, that Part of, the, part of what attracted us to the Republican Party was the notion, a philosophical notion of free markets and keeping government out of our yeah. lives where it's not necessary. It's, so it's, it's been a, an extreme, it seems incredibly uh, 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 ironic that the Republican Party would, that's supposed to be staying out of your lives, is imposing itself in people's lives on this debate. And so it's, it seems contrary to me to the Republican philosophy and principles, and so it's problematic on its if face. If not hypocritical. That's yeah. the word I was just looking for. It's out of, yeah. out, of the out of the boardroom and into the bedroom yeah. is the problem. Yeah. Well, by, let, me, let me say it my, my Louisiana way. For a party that thinks government ought to be smaller and less intrusive and less invasive, they feel that way until it comes to a social issue that they want to push. And you can't have it both ways. Yeah. You either trust the people or the government. And the greatest enemy of our liberty, this is a founding father who said it, is not some foreign country. It's the American government. That's why we need to be involved, register to vote, and have our opinions heard, Jesse. I'm with you on this. Amen, my Amen. friend. <laughs> so study up. <laughs> we have a question that's come in from Twitter from Jane Purcell. Uh, this is a question for you, Bob. On what policy issue have you changed your views the most over the years? Policy issue I've changed my views on most. It's a good question, but mm -hmm. why don't we come back to that after I've had a chance? To <laughs> Give us some thought. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll do uh, we'll do one more. I had uh, from farther further. Um, <laughs> what insights can you share with us about your performance at the Bohemian Grove? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I don't talk much about the Bohemian Grove because, it, you know, it's, it's a place that people go to get away from, from the spotlight. You know, a lot of, a lot of relatively uh, well-known guys are members of that club. Uh, basically, it was founded uh, 130 years ago or so. Uh, by artists and writers, for artists and writers. And still, in order to get in, you have to have something to offer in that, in that, kind, in that regard. A lot, of the, a lot of the members are, uh, you know, successful entrepreneurs or businessmen of one sort or another, but they, they all have an artistic bent. Um, the stuff you hear about it in the rumor mill is, while entertaining, I've never caught any virginal sacrifices, <laughs> um, anything kind of remotely like that. He's I have had some interesting times up there. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of movers and shakers in that club, and I enjoy the, uh, I enjoy the chance, given my, my, my mindset, my Weltschmerz, if you will, uh, I enjoy a chance to, to get to get together with those guys and knock a couple back and uh, and talk it down. I one time I uh, spent a weekend up there. Um, I ran into a guy named uh, General Bill Quinn, and we had a couple drinks together. We were sitting in front of a fireplace, and we just started telling we we. We fell, fell in together, and we started telling, you know, war stories. He was the guy that uh, Hermann Goering uh, sur surrendered, not his sword, but his, basically it was a mace. He surrendered his, but he, uh, he, sought, uh, he sought out Bill Quinn, uh, Wild Bill Quinn, who was also the, uh, the, original, um, the original head of the OSS, which became the CIA. He was a very, very interesting guy. 
And we just went back and forth. We had a crowd of people um, gathered around us at all times. And we'd, we'd about late afternoon, we'd, uh, we'd wander onto the deck where the fireplace was, sit down, get, grab a couple of drinks, and just start going back and forth. That kind of stuff, you know, th these kinds of meetings and stuff like that are only going to happen there. Or, you know, that's th it's the only place where you can almost be assured of, uh, th where I can almost be assured of that, of meeting folks like this. Uh, so it's a it's a great opportunity for me. It's also a great club. There's a, there's a there's a sort of a, a an unwritten but a, a hard and fast rule for uh, membership: uh, no jerks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they have an, an entrance committee that, uh, that that they can sniff them out. <laughs> well, Bob, those are those are great insights, and I always appreciate it. I always appreciate how much you share of yourself with Headcount. Uh, this is really an amazing night. I, I hope people out there are really enjoying it. Uh, we're having a great time here, and uh, if you are enjoying this webcast, I am going to make the pitch again. Uh, Headcount is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We do voter registration at concerts all over America and put on great events like this. If you like what you're seeing, please support us by visiting tristudios.com. Uh, TRISTudios.com and buying a poster or a t-shirt from this event or visiting our website headcount.org and making a donation or if you don't have a few bucks for making a donation even better is to volunteer. We are out at concerts every single day of the week every week of the year up until the election and uh, it would be great if you if you want to be a part of something like this to consider volunteering go to our website just uh, put your email in on the volunteer page and you can be a part of of this movement of music fans one by one individually working together to try to make a difference and we hope that people out there will consider doing that um, I want to tell you also that we have an event coming up on the Brooklyn side of, uh, of America we're gonna do a VIP event at the further show at Coney Island uh, on July 13th and if you go to our website you can order tickets for that so there's just so many ways you can support us so many ways you can get involved with what we're doing, and we really hope from this event that we're going to meet a lot of new people and get a lot of new support. Um, we're going to put on a short video and uh, take it back uh, to music afterward. Um, so we just, we couldn't be happier, we couldn't be more grateful to Bob, to everybody at TRI Studios, and to all of you out there for watching. So yeah. thank you very much. Well, and one more thing, one more thing real quick. We may, we may get around to doing this again before the election, um, and if we do, we'll try to, we'll try to keep this, this part of the show from uh, looking and sounding quite so much like a public television <laughs> <laughs> fundraising drive. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to do this again. Uh, we, we're in, man. We're in. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a short video about headcount, um, and then we're actually going to meet some headcount volunteers, and then we're going to have another uh, set of music. And Baba, I'm really moved by the performance. I've been watching the rehearsal for a couple days, and I, uh, I just can't thank you enough. And I think everybody out there feels the same way that uh, it's just it was a truly great night. Well, thanks. <laughs> I think of it as like, I guess, the spirit of, you know, Grateful Dead, sort of just like, just the way, like, the, the to family, the, feel. the feeling where there's like a crew. Yeah, just like a, the whole kind of like, I guess the organization, <laughs> in a yeah. way, is a, is a, I think, a big influence on us. Never really thought about it being a hugely different thing or a different world, even though obviously, you know. I guess become, more culturally, I guess. Yeah, I guess culturally. It's, it's a divide or a, that's what we're doing, the bridge session. Yes. <laughs> to cross that divide. Well, I've been listening to The National, I've been listening to their stuff, and, and they're a good band, and this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to playing with them. I guess we're trying to put a little bit of our own spin on the songs, yeah. but also, like, you know, kind of honor, I guess, where they came from. Maybe even come to some meetings of minds and stuff like that. I'm looking forward to mixing it up. 
an opportunity to play with someone who we've looked up to for so long, and it was that was the that was the big draw for us. It was like, oh my god, we get to play with Bob Weir. That sounds fantastic. I think, you know, we're most excited, I think, from just working with Headcount, you know, and just the sort of activism that they do. Headcount is, first and foremost, it's a voter registration organization. We try to register voters, um, and particularly voters within the demographic, if you will, of, uh, of uh, the concert going uh, audience, you know, people who come to hear music. We figure a lot of those folks might get kind of slack and uh, and let the election sort of pass them by. And we don't think that's a good idea because most of them are young and uh, it's their futures that are being voted on. Yeah, I mean, they've come and uh, had a table at many yeah. shows that we've done and I don't know, we think it's pretty great that someone's actively like encouraging people to register to vote and to participate in the yeah, political process can get... and all that because it's like, it's very, you yeah. know. It but... makes it easier, I think. TRI started, you know, it's just been sort of a work in progress. It's a recording and broadcast facility. It's state of the art. Everything that we have in here is as good as you can get. The place was built basically uh, to be the ultimate playpen for a musician. It's also real easy to hear in here so that musicians, when they're playing in here, they don't need headphones and we try to get away without using headphones because everybody can hear each other. That gives everybody a chance to play with everybody else and it gives the music a, a cohesion. All right. Okay, everyone, how's it going? I am standing here with a lovely lo young woman here, and uh, the purpose here now is to talk about the volunteers. Volunteers of Headcount are the heart and soul of this organization. When we started Headcount seven years ago, it was four and a half years at least before we had anything but volunteers working with us, and it was... Uh, an incredible thing to see so many people from all over the country coming together and wrapping their head around one cause and making a social change together in a community. And I'm standing here with uh, one of our volunteers. Why don't you tell us your name and how long you've been with Headcount? My name is Laura Scalette, and I've been a volunteer with Headcount since 2004. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> right from the start. All right, well, why don't you tell me, uh, let's see, for you, why don't you tell me what's your favorite thing about Headcount, volunteering for Headcount? <laughs> my, favorite <laughs> my, favorite <thing. laughs> my favorite thing about uh, volunteering for Headcount is the amazing uh, friends and family that I've made throughout this organization. Um, you know, there's just this awesome group of people that come together, and, you know, it's, it's the music, but it's more than the music. It's the power of music, and it's the movement, and, you know, just... By being involved with Headcount, you're int you're introduced to so many cool people and experiences. And besides the dancing, that's my favorite part about Headcount. <laughs> and it is all about the community. Headcount is all about the people coming together, working together. And uh, and thank you for that. We have another volunteer that we want to talk to now. We have three volunteers to talk to here, and it's all about the volunteers. I cannot stress enough, whenever we have a mic in our hands and we start to talk about headcount, the thing that we want to talk about the most is the volunteers, because we honestly, the, the artists help us, the board of director, they're all, it's all amazing. Without the volunteers, we're nothing. These are the people who are putting their hours in on the street, and why don't you tell me what's your name? Uh, my name is Laura Bedrick. How long, how long have you been with Headcount? Uh, recently, September, I've been uh, interning in the office. In the office, in New York City. Yeah. Wow. That's <laughs> so tell me, what do you get out of volunteering for Headcount? Um, I mean, definitely the community. Uh, Laura uh, over there, um, we just met tonight, and uh, we've been talking on the internet for months, and uh, 
definitely building a connection with everyone. And uh, I've been so welcomed, even though I have just started. Uh, I was in Denver recently and uh, got to stay with some headcount volunteers who I never met. And there's, it's more than a community, it's a family. It is. Headcount is a family for sure. And it's going to go hopefully for many, many more years. One more volunteer here. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. One more volunteer here. Tell me your name. John Perry. You've been with Headcount since? Uh, 2009. Okay. So what, uh, one of the things... About one of the things about Headcount is that the volunteers all have very interesting backstories here, and I, I just want to ask John a question about what it is that he does outside of Headcount. What do you do outside of Headcount? Uh, I'm an organizer at Change.org, which is an online campaigns platform where anyone anywhere comes and starts uh, petitions and online campaigns about anything that's important to them. Yeah, and so what's important to you right now? Uh, well, the big thing I'm working on right now is around a, a kid called Tr uh, named Trevon Martin who. Uh, was, uh, yeah, he's sort of making some huge news. Uh, he was killed um, at 17 years old, unarmed, and police in Sanford, uh, Florida, refused to arrest the man who shot him. Um, he's an Afri African-American kid, and I uh, actually worked with his parents to help them start a, a campaign online that, at this point, nearly two million people have signed, um, and it's creating sort of outrage around the, around the world. So you guys have all heard of Trayvon Martin, right? Yeah, you could thank John Perry here right now for having heard about him because he's basically made a national movement out of that case. This is what the volunteers at Headcount are about. We've always said that we hope that we could be a plat. We hope that we could be a. <laughs> we hope that we could be a platform for um, for kids to learn about activism. And we've had so many of our volunteers over the years have moved on to do other things in the act uh, in the world of activism. And we have other people coming in from organizations like Change.org and helping us here at Headcount, and so there's a, a, a lot of synergy between the, the different kinds of organizations, uh, and I thank you, John, for coming out here, and I want to thank all, all of the people who came here. One more. We have one more volunteer. We have one more volunteer to talk to you. What's your name? My name is Rachel Weiss. Rachel. Ha. Everybody for Rachel. Rachel. How long have you been volunteering for Headcount? I started volunteering for Headcount in 2006 in New York City, and I recently moved to the Bay Area about two years ago, and I transferred to the Bay Area team. And it's been awesome, just like Laura and Laura said, that we are a family and a community, and it's really great. Do you have a best experience that you can remember with Headcount, something that you've done out there over the years that sticks, stands out a little bit? Honestly, tonight has been such an amazing experience. Tonight, being here with everyone who's made Headcount possible and just the supporters and everything. And the music has just been incredible. I want to say one more time, thanks to the volunteers. And don't forget, if you want to make a donation, headcount.org. If you want to buy the merch, tristudios.com. I want to thank everybody. We see it coming in. We see donations coming in. And I want to thank you guys for making your donations out there in the interweb world. One more time, everybody. Bob Weir in the National. Thing working, yeah. My uncle went riding down this 
South Colorado, West Tennessee down. We stopped over in Santa Fe. That day in the morning, just about halfway. And you know, it was the hardest part of the day. I took the horses, dropped to the stall. Went to the bar room, ordered drinks for all. Three days in the saddle, no my body hurt. It been summer, well I took off my shirt. And I tried to wash off some of that dusty dirt. West Texas cowboys, there's a As you all can no doubt tell out there, this is all meticulously rehearsed. <laughs> Something 
but buried inside Without no compromise And I don't pretend And I don't even care if I see her again
God And the old man never was the same again burnt like hell And I cut hickory just to fire the stiff Drink down a bottle and you're ready to kill Me 
Standing on the moon, I got no cobweb on my shoe. Standing on the moon, and I am feeling so alone and blue. You see the Gulf of Mexico, tiny.
defeat A scrap of some old lullaby Some forgotten street Thank you. 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to um, sort of part the crowd here and set up right out there. We need a big circle around this mic. You guys are going to love this. It's going to pay off. Does everyone spread a little semicircle around this way? Unheard of in the music. And you're going to love this or you're going to hate it, but we're going to do it. Check, check. Choose to leave my 
Sweet songs to rock my soul. 
gonna plant a new willow by the bang screen edge. Lovers come and go, the river Fare you well, fare you well. I love you more than words can tell. Listen to the river sing sweet songs to rock my soul.
I think of it as like, I guess, the spirit of, you know, Grateful Dead, sort of just like, just the way, like, the, the concert family, feel. The feeling where there's like a crew. Yeah, just like, like the whole kind of like, I guess the organization.